Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lisa Galicchio, who is a, a program director and an epidemiologist in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Uh, Lisa will be moderating our next sessions, highlighting uh, just international collaboration as well as um, just the research can be found within the National Cancer Institute. Lisa? Okay, thanks, Tram. You can hear me? Yes. Good. I think this has been a wonderful conference so far, and I think this session on resources, needs, and opportunities builds nicely on what we've heard this morning on registries and what we heard just now on resource sharing. So the first part of this um, session is on international research collaborations. We'll have two pre presentations here, and then we'll focus on NCI grants, research, and resources. We'll save all questions as we've been doing to the panel presentation or the panel discussion. So if you have questions, enter them as you have in chat, or you can raise your hand during the panel discussion and I will call on you. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jill Koschel from the National Cancer Institute. I believe she has a recording. Good afternoon, and many thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you today about the international field effort that we built in Chile and why this kind of collaboration is important. Chile Biliary Longitudinal Study, or Chile Bills, is a cohort of women with gallstones in Chile that we designed to try to understand why the rates of gallbladder cancer are so high in Chile. To put things in context, the gallbladder stores and concentrates bile produced by the liver to aid in the digestion of fatty foods in the small intestine. Gallbladder cancer is one type of biliary tract cancer, and I tend to do a lot of work on gallbladder cancer. One reason I'm especially interested in gallbladder cancer is because I think it's a particularly good model for understanding how inflammation contributes to the development of cancer. For example, gallstones are the single most important risk factor that we know of, and they create a great deal of inflammation in the gallbladder. Other proposed risk factors also have an inflammatory component. For example, gram-negative bacteria like Salmonella typhi and obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Gallbladder cancer is also more common in women than in men, and yet very little work has been done to understand this cancer. One reason for that is because gallbladder cancer is rare in much of the world. However, there are parts of the world where gallbladder cancer constitutes a major public health burden. One example is the southern central region of Chile, where rates are about 16 per 100,000 in women and 5 per 100,000 in men. Rates are more intermediate in a place like Shanghai, China, but still quite a bit higher than what you see in a low-risk country like the U.S. And that said, even here in the U.S., there are about 12,000 new cases of gallbladder and other biliary tract cancers every year, about 4,000 deaths. And there are notable disparities in the incidence rates with the highest rates among indigenous populations, as well as among Hispanics and other non-white populations. And yet very little work has been done to understand this cancer. As I mentioned, one thing that we do know is important is the presence of gallstones. Gallstones are present in the vast majority of gallbladder cancer cases, and a number of studies have shown that gallstones are strongly associated with increased risk of gallbladder cancer. Studies have also shown that gallstones are present long before cancer is diagnosed, but at the same time, it's been estimated that only about 1% of individuals with gallstones will go on to develop gallbladder cancer. And that is based on low-risk populations. We really don't have good data from high-risk populations. 
But taken together, this evidence suggests that gallstones indicate an important increased risk of gallbladder cancer, but that in and of themselves, they're not sufficient for the development of cancer. And so an important unanswered question is among people who've already developed gallstones, what drives that progression to gallbladder cancer? Chile is a good place to address this question because it has a high prevalence of gallstones and among the highest rates of gallbladder cancer in the world. The rates are particularly high in the southern central region where there's also a large concentration of individuals with Mapuche Amerindian ancestry. The Mapuche are the largest ethnic group in this region. There are also many understudied or novel exposures of interest. And just to give a couple of examples, heavy metals could be of, of importance here, as well as aflatoxin. And at the same time, there is an urgent need to identify individuals with gallstones who are at the highest risk of developing gallbladder cancer so that they can be prioritized for cholecystectomy, which is the surgical removal of the gallbladder. Designing the Chile Bills cohort uh, involved first figuring out what the specific aims are. And in this case, the specific aim was to identify the epidemiologic and molecular predictors of high grade dysplasia and cancer in the gallbladder. Some of the exposures that we're especially interested in include chronic inflammation, aflatoxin and obesity, diabetes and metabolic syndrome. We are also interested in characterizing the stages of disease in gallbladder cancer. For instance, what's associated with intestinal metaplasia, with low grade dysplasia, with high grade dysplasia, and finally with cancer. And we're collecting many biologic specimens in Chile bills, which will help us address this question. Identifying the cohort involved first identifying about 29,000 women aged 50 to 74, and then screening them for gallstones with ultrasound to get to our cohort of 4,726 women. We're following this, these women for six years with study visits every other year. And I estimate that in the end, we'll identify about 180 to 200 high grade dysplasia and gallbladder cancer outcomes. Right now, we're finishing up the two year follow-up visit and working on the four-year visit with about 85 to 90% compliance. And I just want to take a minute here to highlight that these high response rates really showcase the creativity, the dedication, and the enthusiasm of the field staff that we have. Without their efforts to go above and beyond, we would not be at these high response rates, especially in the middle of a global pandemic. So I just want to emphasize that who you have working in that international field effort is really critical. And I am honored to be working with such a talented team in Chile. And at the same time as we're conducting these field visits, women are going to surgery. We've already had 1,700 women go to cholecystectomy to have their gallbladder removed. To give you a sense of the biologic specimens that we're collecting, at baseline, we collected plasma serum and Pax gene RNA tubes. And at the follow-up visits, we're collecting plasma and serum. Now, as people go to surgery, we're doing our best to get pre-surgical blood samples, and if we can, to get fresh frozen tissue, gallstones, and bile. And we are getting FFPE tissue on just about everybody. The work that we've done in Chile has already been productive. Just to give you one example, in the Chile pilot study, we identified a novel association between aflatoxin and gallbladder cancer. We then replicated that finding in a study from Shanghai, China, where we also estimated the proportion of gallbladder cancers that potentially could be due to aflatoxin, both in China and in Chile. And in fact, this work has already had an important impact in Chile. I presented the results of these two studies to the Chilean Ministry of Health in October of 2016. And then they went and tested a number of American spice blends for mycotoxins because there was concern that there might be contamination there. And in fact, in the end, they pulled one brand off of the shelves in January of 2017. I bring this example up just to demonstrate 
the seriousness with which the Chilean government takes our work and how important this work is. To bring it back to the US, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that indigenous populations in the US are at high risk. They have an increased risk of gallbladder cancer and particularly in the southwestern states which leads me to wonder if aflatoxin could be part of that increased risk. Previous studies have shown that marginalization is associated with higher exposure to aflatoxin, and that could be due to consumption of self-produced rather than commercially produced foods, because commercial foods are treated and stored to prevent fungal growth and tested to ensure low levels of aflatoxin but rural marginalized populations are more likely to eat the food that they grow themselves rather than these commercially produced products. They might also be more likely to be exposed to aflatoxin through inhalation of contaminated livestock feed products. High exposure to aflatoxin has been demonstrated in indigenous and low socioeconomic status populations in Mexico and Africa. And it leads me to wonder if it could be a problem here in the US as well. Finally, I'd like to end with a few take home points. And the first is that geographic hotspots facilitate etiologic studies and the identification of targets for cancer prevention and early detection. And I think that aflatoxin is a great example of this. We saw an association between aflatoxin and gallbladder cancer in Chile and replicated it elsewhere, but it started right here with this geographic hotspot. Also, many of the most common cancers in the US are related to inflammation and to obesity. Gallbladder cancer is strongly associated both with inflammation and obesity. So what we learn about gallbladder cancer in Chile might help our understanding of inflammation and obesity associated cancers that are more common in the US. And finally, associations that we observe between Mapuche and non-Mapuche women in Chile bills might help inform the disparities that we see in indigenous populations here in the US. And just to wrap it up, I do wanna say that I'm very interested in collaborations. So if Chile Bills sounds interesting to you, please feel free to follow up with me and I'd love to talk with you more. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Jill, and we will hold questions till the end. Our second speaker on international research collaborations is Dr. Laura Feherman, who we heard from yesterday. Dr. Feherman is an associate professor at the University of California, Davis. I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, my uh, presentation is gonna focus, really is following the, what I discussed yesterday. So, uh, kind of it's a continuation because I ended saying international collaborations were really important when studying cancer epidemiology in HLs. And now I'm just going to give a few examples of models of collaboration just to show the diverse possibility or, or ways and, um, you know, we, we, we can work with Latin America to um, advance cancer epidemiology. So my motto is Latin America is full of Latin Americans. Um, there are great physicians and scientists in Latin America ready for, to collaborate. Um, many hospitals and research um, organizations have infrastructure for research. They have the uh, human subjects, you know, ethical uh, committees. They can get IRB approval. They have, some of them have electronic medical records, biobanks, and um, people within these institutions, uh, you know, with the training um, uh, to collaborate. The problem is local funding is scarce. And here I just found some information on what proportion of the gro gross domestic product of different countries in Latin, in Latin America, it also includes Portugal and Spain, you know, what percent is being used in research? And you can see that many Latin American countries have a lot less investment 
and therefore there's a lot less resources for investigators over there to, to do large studies, especially involving analysis of biospecimens with cutting edge technologies that are very expensive because the technologies are produced outside the countries and the costs are, you know, um, kind of at the dollar cost, not the local pesos cost. So this is where we can collaborate with Latin American scientists and physicians to uh, generate knowledge that I think benefits everyone. It benefits um, investigators uh, and the population of the US because we're learning about characteristics of uh, the HL po population abroad. Um, and, and, and also it benefits uh, the, the Latin American countries because they get first to also, you know, we teach each other, we, we transfer skills to each other. Also they get to, for example, genotype data with a race that they wouldn't be able to afford to do, but then they can do analysis themselves. So I think there's a lot of potential in this kind of collaborations as, you know, the Chile study shows. Um, and I just want to highlight, uh, this is not exhaustive. There's more models of collaboration, but I, uh, I just want to illustrate there's no one way of doing this. You can create large international consortia, which includes investigators in the US, a funding or Europe and uh, uh, from the local, you know, from the Latin American countries. And then you can also have uh, US investigator initiated grants. For example, you can write an R01 with a foreign component um, and, and that's a different model. I'm not, all these models have pros and cons and I'm just quickly gonna go through them. And I uh, just selected a few studies that I am very familiar with. This is not because they are the best studies or uh, because they are the only studies, it's just the ones I work on. So one example of a consortia is the Latin American Genetics and Genomics of Breast Cancer Consortium. We're working on a website, so you can't look it up yet, but it's coming. And it's basically uh, investigators with already existing um, biospecimens and, and data and information from uh, breast cancer patients or breast cancer patients and controls. Um, and we together by now it's about 67,000 um, uh, individuals included in the consortia if we put together all the data um, and about half of those are cases and half of those are controls. And you can see we have, I think we have 12 countries represented in there. And the idea is to you know, generate a resource where uh, external investigators can also apply to do analysis. And the way this is, you know, basically the, the driving force for this is the, uh, the will of the investigators to do this and invest their time. And because um, Confluence, which is an intramural initiative uh, from NCI, I think uh, Monse Garcia Closas is gonna talk about it uh, later today. Um, they are trying to do a mega GWAS of breast cancer. They are providing some coordination support. So that, that's what pushed us to create LAGENO. Um, but uh, we're focusing in, on, on getting some core data together, harmonizing the core data, and then uh, Confluence will be able to help with genotyping for studies that have by specimens, but they don't have genotype data. And this will be used for large collaborative studies, but then it'll be the genotype data will be will belong to the investigators in, in Latin America, for example, and they will be able to do, you know, uh, further research on their own. Um, I just wanted to show you all the people, some, you know, some people I don't have the pictures yet, but it's really a wonderful group with uh, Latin American and US investigators. The pros are, you know, we're getting to, it's not comparable to non-Hispanic YGWAS, but you know, it's not terrible anymore. We're gonna get there. Um, we have diversity because many countries are represented in terms of genetic diversity and ancestry proportions. Um, uh, and, and it's not so hard to create these consortiums because in a way, some of the data is already there. The studies already exist. So it's a coordination effort. 
the 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 cons are it's the logistics are hard there's a lot of coordination a lot of people involved uh sustainability is a big issue you know how we keep once all the data is generated how we keep this um, infrastructure going um there's a heterogeneity of design um and a lack of common protocols and, and missing data for some studies so the good thing is it's a large sample, so uh, you end up having a lot of information. And this works for genetic epidemiology studies. It might not be ideal for if you're looking at um, environmental factors um, and you have a lot of heterogeneity between studies. Another model is uh, uh, the um, example of a model of uh, a collaborative net network is the Latin American Cancer Research Network. And it involved five countries in Latin America, and uh, it was created in collaboration with um, the NCI. Um, and 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 really, like the different groups put some resources, and um, including the U.S., but also like the local governments were involved, or the uh, scientific organizations that provide funding locally, and they created this fabulous fabulous um, uh, uh, set of, it's only case, sorry. It's only cases, uh, but they have a lot of uh, detail on um, kind of, they have epidemiological information. They have a, a frozen tumor tissue that they were able to analyze. They have gene expression data now from that. They have uh, harmonize between countries uh, clinical protocols and standardized operating procedures, a lot of QC and QA with supervision from, from NIH investigators. So it's, it's really solid. It's a great study. It's a great model for collaboration. But again, there's pros and cons. So you have all the uh, pros um, that I mentioned, but um, also you have issues of uh, you end up with a relatively small sample size because you're being so meticulous with the procedures. It's really hard to uh, recruit tons of patients when you have um, this kind of uh, very, very organized uh, data collection system, including biobanking of biospecimens. Um, for investigator initiating grant uh, model, um, there's different flavors. Two of them um, uh, are related to uh, either you have a study in Latin America, for example, and uh, a U.S. investigator adds a component to that, and both, you know, and and it's led by the U.S. investigator, but the local investigator gets additional data. Um, and um, there's also this model where there's not not an existing in, there's no study. Prior to this, the study is generated as part of a hypothesis-based proposal uh, um, submitting, in this case, was an R01. And this is the PEGEN study that I put together with amazing collaborators in Peru. Tatiana Vidaure was my main collaborator. And now I've also been working with Dr. Casabil Casambrano, who's the director of the Biobank there. And um, this you know, was very focused on understanding a protective variant that is high frequency in indigenous American populations, but actually now is a resource that we can use to further understand uh, genetic risks uh, for breast cancer in a highly indigenous American group, like a woman uh, from the National Cancer Institute there. And there's more than 2000 patients who have been recruited and we have some FFP tumor tissue as well and genome-wide genotype data. Um, another example like this is the gamma study. Um, again, these are not the only studies. Uh, there's also uh, my, my colleague at UC Davis, Bliss Carvajal Carmona, also has a collaboration with Colombia and Mexico and collaborates. So following this kind of, of design where um, there's uh, either you start a cohort that wasn't there or there, there was something there and your proposal helps uh, support some of the infrastructure to expand it. So sorry, I'm just running through because of time. Uh, again, there's a simpler infrastructure when, when it's like a, a foreign component, usually involves one or two institutions in Latin America, not like a large consortia. 
Um, uh, coordination is easier, but uh, it's sometimes it's less diverse because you're working with only one institution or two. And again, there's sustainability issues with the infrastructure once funding is over. And so um, I just want to conclude that cancer research in Hispanic Latinos should be an international effort. Th there are limited resources in Latin America, and therefore I think uh, investigators in, in um, more um, countries with more resources should support and collaborate in a way that everyone gains um, something. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I think sustainability and growth of, of ongoing studies and future studies is an issue and um, NIH should uh, try to figure out how to, to um, sustain these rich resources for research. That's it, sorry. Thank you, Laura. And we're gonna take a little bit of a turn here in subject matter, but we'll come back to Laura and Jill in the panel discussion. So now we're going to focus on the landscape of NCI research and opportunities. And our first speaker is Ms. Camille Pottinger from the National Institute of Aging, and she'll be talking about our cancer epidemiology grant portfolio in Hispanic populations. Camille? Thanks, Lisa. Um, so as uh, Dr. Bluefield just mentioned, um, I am a new health specialist at the National Institute on Aging, but prior to that position, um, I was working at the National Cancer Institute within the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences um, on a portfolio analysis project to describe the current landscape of cancer um, epidemiologic grants within um, Hispanic populations. And um, I will share some of those findings today. Um, thank you to the planning team for allowing me to um, present today. So um, the purpose of the um, portfolio analysis was to provide an overview of NIH's grant portfolio from fiscal years 2016 to 2021 of camper, cancer epidemiologic studies with a focus on Hispanic population as well as to identify areas of uh, research needs and gaps. Um, QVR and PMA, which are internal NIH uh, search tools, were used to identify relevant grants that fit this first set of broad criteria. So we were really interested in identifying grants that had ca cancer outcomes, um, had an epi focus. Um, we were interested in you know, grants that contain human studies. Um, and we also included some um, Hispanic related specific terms in order to make sure we were identifying um, relevant grants. Um, after that initial search, um, we then did a manual review looking at specific aims of grants um, to further identify relevant grants that fall into these either of these two categories. So the first category, we were interested in, you know, looking within the specific aims for grants that had a specific focus on Hispanic populations. So they were intentional about targeting um, Hispanic populations for their recruitment. Um, the second category was um, looking within the specific aims again, um, looking at um, studies that had a, a comparative uh, racial ethnic um, analysis um, and including Hispanic. Um, populations within that as well. So um, if, either, if either of those criteria um, fit, then we included the grants um, into our analysis. And in the end, we identified 44 um, relevant grants. Thirty-seven grants were primarily funded um, by NCI, as you can see here, and the majority were within NCI were also within the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Um, but we also want to recognize um, a few amount of grants in which NCI was a secondary funder to NIMHD, which um, Dr. Uh, Doss mentioned in her previous presentation today, and um, the National Genome Research Institute, um, NGRI, as well as um, a few other NIHICs.
Um, we found that 15 grants had a primary focus of studying Hispanic populations and 29 grants had a focus of conducting some uh, type of racial ethnic comparative analysis in which Hispanic populations was included. Also of interest, we wanna mention that over half of our identified grants um, were in response to um, a solicited funding opportunity announcement, which really highlights NCI's commitment to um, this important field. And as far as grant mechanisms, we identified that the majority were either um, using R or U mechanisms. So this slide just goes, goes into a little bit um, more detail about um, the different categories that either of our relevant grants fell into. So for example, for category one, um, let's say for grant three, um, their objective was to understand the multi-level drivers of liver cancer disparities and compared outcomes. Um, uh, for, sorry, for grant two was to identify um, individual and contextual factors leading to disruption and continuation of care after Hurricane Irma in Puerto Rico. So it would fall into category one and we would include that kind of grant. Um, for category two, for grant three, as I was saying, for the objective was to understand the multi-level drivers of liver cancer disparities and compared outcomes among various racial ethnic groups, then we would include that because it's an analysis study. Um, and so those are just like two examples of the types of grants that we included. In terms of cancer endpoints, breast, colorectal, and liver cancers were the most studied cancers. Um, and these are also among the most prevalent um, cancers in Hispanic populations as well. Um, there were also several grants that studied multiple cancer sites. In terms of exposures, um, they really varied across broad categories. Um, however, the majority did focus on biological or genetic factors. Fewer grants looked at sociocultural factors, healthcare related factors, and socioeconomic and structural factors, um, which could be um, a gap in research. The vast majority of grants um, did not include or report information on a specific heritage group. Um, those who did were predominantly just, um, described targeting populations of um, either Mexican or Puerto Rican descent, which has been highlighted quite a bit in previous um, presentations with this workshop. This graph, oh, oops. This graph reflects the distribution of grants across the cancer continuum as described by um, DCCPS. And the majority of grants primarily focused on um, cancer in either the etiologic or survivorship stages. Fewer grants focused on prevention, detection, um, diagnosis, and treatment, um, which could also indicate a gap in research. This slide shows the distribution of study designs across the portfolio. Um, the total number of grants does exceed 44, um, but that's because some grants might have included multiple uh, study designs. Of interest, um, data from the multi-ethnic cohort study or MEC was often leveraged, um, as we've heard uh, from previous presentation. And we identified uh, data from MEC um, was used in about 33% um, of the relevant grants that were identified. Um, so it's important to leverage existing resources um, that are out there to study this population. The blue box on the left includes the studies we identified um, in the course um, of the analysis. And then for the yellow box on the right, we want to mention additional resources, including SEER and state registries, which we've heard presentations on today. Um, and also some examples of some existing um, cancer epidemiology cohorts that NCI supports. Um, also, we want to acknowledge two new survivorship cohorts um, from NCI in response to a recent RFA. Um, that was mentioned yesterday. And um, just to say that this is in no way an exhaustive list of every possible resource out there, but 
Um, we hope this is a good starting point and we hope that it's helpful. Um, we also just wanted to highlight that this is the most recent enrollment table by race and ethnicity for NCI supported cancer epi cohorts. Um, the portfolio, as you can see, mainly comprises of white, Asian, and Black populations, and the Hispanic populations is at 6%. So just in summary, to wrap it up, um, this analysis included 44 relevant grants, um, with NCI being the primary funder of 37 of those grants, 34% of the grants had a specific focus targeting Hispanic populations, um, and a majority of um, the grants submitted were to um, a solicited NIH FOA. Um, the most frequently studied cancers included breast, colorectal, and liver. Um, the majority also focused on etiologic and survivorship stages of cancer. There was limiting reporting on um, heritage groups um, or subpopulations in the grants. And we also recognize that there is um, interest in collaboration across NIH and the scientific community to further this um, research um, among this population. And so we have mentioned some existing and new resources to hopefully help leverage um, this area. Um, th this slide is just to include some, you know, even more resources that we have. Um, the CEDCD or the Cancer Epidemiology Descriptive Cohort Database um, is a database that pr provides um, descriptive um, data on various cohorts. Um, so that may be of use. Um, Reporter is our public facing NIH search tool that investigators can use um, to search grants. Um, and also we have our um, cohort consortium annual meeting coming up in November, um, which is a consortium of various cohorts um, across that also may be of some use. I would just like to thank and acknowledge the NCI Cancer and Hispanics Working Group um, for their overall guidance um, and support with this uh, portfolio analysis. Um, they participated in reviewing, doing quality control, um, and also helping with this presentation. So thank you, and I will take questions uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you, Camille. And we're sad to see Camille go to NIA, but know that that's the next step in her career, but she'll continue to work with us on the portfolio. And I do want to say, I know most of you know that there are breakout sessions tomorrow, but if you have ideas about gaps or needed resources, please enter them into the chat and we'll monitor that, as well as, of course, you can put in your questions for the panel discussion. So our next speaker is Dr. Amy Kennedy, and she will focus on NCI resources and funding opportunities. Amy? Thanks, Lisa. And Bryce, do I have control? Or are you doing slides for me? Uh, whichever you prefer. You can do it if you'd like. Okay. That'll be great. So next slide. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Kennedy. I'm from the NCI. And today I'll be presenting an overview of NCI resources, initiatives, and funding opportunities relevant to Hispanic populations. So I'll open up by highlighting with specific uh, funding opportunities that are pertinent to this workshop and provide information on where you can find these online. And then in the second half, I'll switch over to present a few different initiatives, which we've heard over the past day and a half, um, that fund projects that focus on Hispanic populations and provide information on a couple of resources um, that we have available as well. And I know I have a lot of links on here and a lot of text, so I believe um, that ICF will make my presentation shareable so you don't have to worry about copying anything down. Um, the last point that I have up here on the slide is um, just to consider um, that when, you know, what I'm highlighting is just a small portion of examples uh, today. So it's important to remember 
um, when thinking about relevant funding opportunities, that even when a funding announcement isn't specific uh, to health disparities or health equity, um, most are very relevant uh, to studying those um, underserved populations. And so it's always encouraged to include um, different minority ethnic uh, underserved populations in your research. Next slide, please. And so this is one of those slides where I said, don't worry, uh, I won't be reading through it, but basically I wanted to include this as a reference um, and provide sort of a laundry list of the wide variety of funding opportunities the NCI and NIH support. So I'll now go through uh, some specific examples from this list um, and talk a bit more in depth, um, but just to have this to reference back to. Next slide. So the first funding opportunity I wanted to highlight is the co-infection in cancer program announcement, uh, which is active through January 2023. Uh, this R01 R21 initiative anticipates applications that will enhance mechanistic and epidemiologic studies, uh, addressing the roles of co-infection with health disparities and health and the inclusion of high-risk underserved populations being one of the research areas of interest. And so, of course, as all of you listening know, this opportunity is particularly relevant to Hispanic populations. As we've heard, Hispanics uh, have higher rates of infection-related cancers, such as liver, stomach, and cervical cancer, with incidence varying um, substantially by nativity and duration of residence. And Dr. Tram Kim Lam is the point of contact if you have any general inquiries or uh, in regards to epidemiologic studies. Next slide, please. And so this next funding opportunity uh, focuses on understanding how factors associated with the immigration experience, um, things such as lifestyle factors, infectious agents, physical and chemical agents, and the social or built environment, uh, how those factors uh, contribute to health disparities or advantages. So the NCI is particularly interested in understanding the relationships between environmental or occupational exposures in cancer etiology, survival, and cancer control. And so again, this is a particular reference to Hispanics, as has been mentioned throughout the workshop, um, that Hispanic Latino populations experience, you know, varied incidence and mortality rates from cancer depending on their nativity and where they've immigrated from. Next slide, please. This next uh, funding opportunity, uh, the Mechanisms of Chronic Liver Disease and Cancer Initiative seeks multidisciplinary research applications that investigate the underlying etiologic factors and mechanisms that contribute to disparities in chronic liver diseases and cancer in the US. And hepatocellular carcinoma is one of the fastest rising uh, causes of cancer-related deaths in the US with Latinos having the greatest increase in liver cancer in recent years. So the focus of this opportunity is understanding how social determinants of health interact with biological and behavioral risk factors to influence liver disease and liver cancer disparities. And this is active through April, 2022. Oh, next slide, please. And so these last two funding announcements that I wanted to mention uh, focus on geographically underserved areas. So the first uh, notice of special interest, the NOSI on the left, uh, focuses on expanding cancer control research in persistent poverty areas, uh, which is defined by the USDA as counties with poverty rates of 20% or more uh, based on US census data from 1980, 90, and 2000. And so this notice uh, seeks multidisciplinary program project applications, so POIs that focus on the development in conduct of cancer control research in low income or underserved populations living in persistent poverty areas. And the uh, final funding opportunity I wanted to mention on the right uh, focuses on rural populations. So this is an R01 announcement uh, that seeks applications to develop, adapt, and test individual, community, or multi-level interventions to address uh, modifiable risk factors for cancer in rural populations. And this uh, has a January 22 expiration date. Next slide. And so here I just wanted to briefly mention a couple of places where you can actually find these funding announcements. Um, so on the left, uh, the link in the screenshot is from the DCCPS funding announcements website. 
uh, which is a user-friendly website where you can um, search current funding opportunities that are accepting applications in regards to cancer control. Uh, you can search by text. There's different filter options uh, with different categories, and then you're able to export or email your results. And on right uh, in the peach box, that is a screenshot of the NIH guide for grants and contracts. And that's the official publication of the notices of grant policies, guidelines, and funding opportunity announcements, um, which too has a similar uh, user-friendly interface where there's different filtering and search options. And mentioned right below is the reference to the weekly email listserv. Um, those emails typically are sent out on Friday, and they include a copy of the current weekly table of contents from the guide so you get um, the most up-to-date funding announcements that were released. Next slide, please. So in the last uh, few slides, I'll present a snapshot of some example of initiative highlights and resources the NCI supports, many which will look familiar as they've been mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, the first initiative is the RFA that was released in 2020, which focused on utilizing cohort studies to address health outcomes in cancer survivors. And two of the funded projects um, focus on Hispanic Latino populations. So the leading pathways studied, uh, which Dr. Pinedo yesterday um, mentioned in his presentation, listed on the left is led by the Mays and Sylvester Cancer Centers. It focuses on adult survivors of various cancer types uh, to understand the association between multiple factors such as social, cultural, psychosocial, medical, and biological um, with a, uh, in cancer survivor outcomes, including symptoms, quality of life, and mortality. In the study on the right, salute the survivorship and access to care for Latinos to understand and address disparities is led by the Dan Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center and aims to establish a Latino pediatric cancer survivors cohort in Texas. And the study plans on characterizing various risk determina determinants of treatment related toxicities in relapse and Latino pediatric cancer survivors in the context of known clinical risk. Next slide. Um, the last initiative, um, again, we've heard of this, uh, the, is in reference to the core infrastructure support uh, for cancer epi cohorts program, which has funded many cohorts over the years. And the multi-ethnic cohort, which was presented uh, earlier, is a cohort that was established in the mid-1990s um, to study risk factors for cancer and other chronic diseases. And so the cohort has over 47,000 Latino members and there's been many research findings and publications coming from this study. And in the bottom left, I've just listed the current program announcement that's open for the core infrastructure support grants. Next slide. Oh, there's a pop-up, next slide. And so Camille just briefly mentioned uh, the Cancer Epidemiology Descriptive Cohort Database, the CEDCD. Um, so this one, compared to my next slide, you may be a little less familiar with. Um, it's a searchable database that contains general information, such as eligibility criteria and size, the type of data collected at baseline, cancer sites, number of participants diagnosed with cancer and biospecimen information, um, with the goal of uh, facilitating collaboration and highlighting opportunities for research within existing cohort studies. So I recommend taking a look to see um, which cohorts may be potentially useful to your research. And next slide. Lastly, um, as Dr. Cronin spoke about earlier today, and most of you are probably familiar with, um, is the valuable resource of SEER registry data. Um, so as we heard, it collects and publishes cancer incidents and survival data from population-based cancer registries, covering approximately 48% of the US population and just shy of 70% uh, for Hispanics. And so, there are a lot of, um, I think that's one of the questions in the discussion is sort of different questions that SEER can answer. Um, so it can be used to address many different problems looking at, um, for example, staging a diagnosis across race and ethnicities, um, determining trends and incident rates uh, over time at different cancer sites. And it's also important to note that uh, SEER has been linked with other large population data sets. And so if you look around at the SEER website, such as SEER Medicare, SEER Medicaid, SEER CAPS, um, that allows researchers to uh, have access to unique data sources. And so next slide. 
that is where I'll stop and I appreciate your attention and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Amy. And our last, but definitely not least, speaker of this session, we're gonna be taking another little bit of a turn here um, and talking about the research being conducted in our intramural program, the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. The final speaker is Dr. Monsi garcia Clausis, who is the Deputy Director for the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics. I'll turn it over to you, Monsi. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, the organizers, for um, allowing me to, uh, to give a, a quick overview of some of the resources um, that we have in our division for, to study cancer epidemiology in Hispanic populations. So it, it, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, our division, this is an intramural research division um, conducting transdisciplinary research to try to better understand the causes of cancer and to inform the means of prevention. These are the research priorities uh, from the division that were recently identified on the most uh, on, on a uh, strategy planning exercise. And here it's why to uh, point to our commitment to study diverse um, populations. So I was asked to focus on three major um, ongoing efforts, which have been um, recently um, launched um, and are in led by investigators in our division in collaboration with um, uh, also extramural investigators. Um, so this is the Connect for Cancer Prevention Study, the Confluence Project that you already heard about uh, from Laura and the Sherlock Lang Study. Uh, so the Connect for Cancer Prevention is a prospective cohort study that's been in the planning for almost, almost 10 years. And we are um, really excited that the uh, launch of the study, the starting of the recruitment uh, started this summer. So this is a, a prospective um, study uh, whose aim is to build a comprehensive research resource to study cancer etiology, risk prediction, early detection, and survivorship. So we are aiming to recruit 200,000 adults across the US for long-term follow-up. And some of the key features of, the, of CONNECT are the collection of serial assessments for exposure and outcome assessment. So this includes questionnaires, biospecimens, electronic healthcare records, imaging, mobile and wearable uh, devices, as well as collection of tissue specimens, um, focusing on premalignal and malignal uh, tissues. Because this is a cancer-focused cohort, uh, we are also aiming for a comprehensive uh, cancer outcome ascertainment, and we'll do that through linkages to tumor registries. So we are building this cohort using a flexible infrastructure that will allow um, enhancement studies as we progress. Um, so the, the, these this, uh, study subjects um, are recruited through partner healthcare systems. These uh, healthcare systems were identified on an open call and um, all the centers that, um, that responded to the call uh, qualified and were funded. And, and these are shown here. So in this meeting with this audience, I'm sure you are all recognizing that unfortunately we did not receive uh, applications from healthcare systems that are in the areas of the US, in the, in the West and the South of the US where there is a higher percentage of Latino populations. Um, so uh, to increase that, the, the percentage of these populations, we will need to add um, site on these regions. I also want to point out the Kaiser Permanente Northwest is one of the sites and the PI was um, Dr. Katrina Goddard, so our next um, DCCPS director. So she's um, very familiar with this effort. Um, to, okay. So this is the, uh, the, dis the race uh, distribution um, from the, that we expect from this cohort, and that is determined by the distribution or the diversity of the catchment population of these healthcare systems that, that, that are participating. So the overall race distribution uh, resembles close to the, um, what we see in the US census, but unfortunately, uh, because of the, uh, of the geographical location I just described, we have an underrepresentation of Hispanic or uh, Latinx populations compared to, uh, to the US. So the, the, the distributions vary by sites. And as I mentioned, um, uh, future efforts might um, we'll try to um, recruit or add sites that are um, in areas that have a more diverse uh, underlying population. So CONNECT was uh, designed to as a research resource for the uh, broad scientific community 
So we are having uh, data sharing policies that will allow this broad access while um, uh, protecting uh, privacy and confidentiality of the participants. And to facilitate that, we are building a data infrastructure following FAIR principles, which stand for um, data to be unfindable, accessible, interoperable, to really have the optimal reuse of the data in as broad as possible. Because of the sensitivity of the data being collected, we are um, we're going to have the data access will be have different levels depending on that the data sensitivity and the data access will be facilitated through a data platform. Uh, the next project is the Confluence project, which is a large multi ancestry genome wide association study that aims to identify genetic variants for um, breast cancer risk overall and by subtype and then use that information to develop multi-ancestry polygenic risk scores for personalized risk assessment, and also trying to understand the genetic determinants of breast cancer um, outcomes. Uh, so Confluence is really a consortium of consortia. So what we are doing here is to bring together multiple consortia, consortia that were existing or just forming um, that had conducted genome-wide association studies and focusing on different populations, but they were working in, uh, in separately. So co Confluence really uh, brings them together and um, increases the sample size of the current um, uh, genome-wide association studies by almost double, doubling the sample size. The Lajeno Consortia that um, uh, Lara just mentioned is, um, is, is, is contributing most of the uh, Latina uh, participants in this. Um, to us. So actually this, oh, unfortunately it's, um, there was a problem with the transferring of the, of, the, uh, of the slides when I send them. This shows the existing genotyping. Um, and then what, um, what's missing here, it's um, the, the new genotyping, which for cases will go up to 335,000 uh, cases. And they, for the controls will go up to 250,000 uh, controls. So it's unfortunate that the, 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 the bar that shows the new genotyping is missing in this in, in, with the file transfer. And this shows the existing um, genotyping data that will be used among the subset of, of samples that are from Latina women. And again, that's missing the new genotyping that will increase the sample size up to about 35,000 cases and about 25,000 controls. So this will be a, a very substantial increase in the sample size. Um, uh, and then we will, be, but because of the collaboration across consortia, we'll be able to also analyze the data together with other data uh, from women of European, um, um, African and Asian ancestries. Um, this shows the, uh, the, the total samples contributing to Lajeno and other um, consortia uh, that the total uh, will be about 70, over 70,000 samples. And this shows the distribution. As uh, Laura says, that shows a, a pretty uh, nice uh, broad uh, geographical distribution to capture the heterogeneity. There are some countries that are still quite underrepresented. And um, this is the, uh, the timeline of the Confluence project. We started in 2018. We are now in the middle of genotyping and sample collection. We are still uh, accepting new studies, either focusing on uh, populations that are underrepresented. So if any of you are familiar or are involved in studies, that you think will be eligible for this collaboration and, and of uh, Latina uh, women uh, will be, or actually, or men, and this includes also females and males, that will be, will be very interesting. Laura and Marcel will be very interested in hearing from you. Um, to facilitate data access, so there will be publicly uh, posting of data through uh, DBGAP, but because this is a multi consortia and uh, effort um, to facilitate access to the data and also to engage. The different contributors of data from all the different studies. We are uh, constructing this uh, data platform um, that will be um, uh, will come live in about in a few weeks. The final study I wanted to mention is the Sherlock Lang study, uh, which is led by uh, Maria Teresa Landi in our division uh, with a um, large number of collaboration collaborations. Um, this is a lung cancer study, in never smokers, that is using um, genomic analysis of tumors to try to um, find some more clues about the etiology of, of lung cancer in never smokers, which is largely unknown. Um, these initial results from this study were um, published in Nature Genetic in this, and this is a picture that, uh, that actually have, was in the cover of this, uh, the current issue of Nature Genetic that published the, the data from the results from the first 300 
um, samples. And that already with that sample size is providing very interesting clues about um, the theology, potential theology, particularly um, endogenous processes that might be uh, involved in the etiology of this um, disease. So the aim is to, um, uh, to uh, sequence and characterize at least 2,000 samples, and we already identify um, over 2,000, uh, 2,600 samples, and 300 of those came from Latin American countries. And um, so this uh, is a, it's a difficult um, um, collection because it requires frozen lung uh, tissue samples from cancer patients that are known to be never smokers in their lifetime. Um, as in confluence um, samples, these, we're still interested in hearing from uh, additional studies that might have this type of, uh, of specimens. So if you're interested in collaborating, you could contact me or uh, Maria Teresa Landi um, to learn more about the study. And then to close, I'd like to point to, um, uh, there are other uh, important and long lasting efforts um, uh, from um, other collaborators in the division and that have a long history of working in Latin American studies. Uh, many of uh, whom I'm sure you know, is the Jill uh, presented the, uh, the biliary cancer study in Chile. And um, there's also studies in other cancers that are overly, overly present in, in Latin populations uh, like cervical liver and gastric as well as, well as um, uh, genetic studies. So thank you very much for your um, attention. So if you want more information, you can email me, look information on our website. And I also wanted to point out our fellowship training. If you are more interested, interested in learning more about it, these are um, fellowships that it, they are both US and non-US citizens are eligible. That's the way I started at, at NCI. Um, and it, it's also a, a great opportunity to establish collaborations with um, different groups uh, and, and, and exchanging uh, fellows. Uh, I encourage you to look at, at this website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Monsi. And I will ask all of our presenters to turn on their cameras for our panel discussion. And again, if you have any questions, enter them into the chat. And while we have Monsi's presentation in our minds, there was a, there's there several comments about the low percentage of Latinos in the new Connect cohort. So the question from one of our audience members is how was the open call for healthcare systems conducted? Was there specific outreach to high Hispanic populations? And related to this, would NCI consider expanding into other areas to increase the percentage of Hispanics in Connect? Yeah, thank you for this question. So this call was an open call. It was targeting integrated healthcare systems. So there was a big outreach to integrated healthcare systems and, and um, to, to try to get as much diverse uh, representation of the population. So for instance, Kaiser Permanente has centers in, 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 other, in other areas um, of the US that were, they did not come through in, in this initial application, but we are aware that there might be of interest of adding additional centers. So what we decided is to focus on um, setting up the, whole, the infrastructure of the study with the uh, initial centers, um, uh, keeping in mind that we will need to add new centers to really increase the population, and then future calls will have to be targeted to, uh, to the areas that are currently underrepresented. But as I mentioned in the presentation, we're really building this cohort using very modern um, technology that should make it quite cost efficient to add additional centers to take advantage of the, of the infrastructure that we're building. And Luis has his hand raised, and I think it's related to his question. So I'll ask Luis to ask his question verbally. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Monse. We have been in multiple think tanks about the need of, you know, diversify the new cohorts. And I understand, you know, I was one of the person put posing the questions about the low pricing of Latinos or the comments. Um, I also understand that, you know, not all the centers are willing to prepare, to collaborate, or have the capacity to do it. I mean, a major limitation with these integrated health systems is that they tend to have also low Latino uh, affiliation. Uh, at least here in Central Valley of California, most of our Latinos well, a good fraction of them are undocumented, so they have no insurance, right? We have the ACI expanded in California, which insured around 12 million people since, you know, since it was expanded. But a lot of them go to FHQAC systems. So if you look, I am the, you know, at UC Davis faculty, but UC Davis health system doesn't see as many Latinos as the 
are these, uh, you know, community health centers. So is your infrastructure, uh, you know, do you think you could modify it or adapt it to, to more local systems that are going to see a more diverse population? In, 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 at least in California, we have ACA. I don't know about Texas or Florida where there are other larger Latino populations, but at least in California, more Latinos go, go through, have their healthcare through FHQACs that don't necessarily have the Kaiser Permanente infrastructure. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and yes, definitely the, the infrastructure we are developing, it's, it can be applied in different healthcare systems. And it also has a big component of a participant application to engage the participant directly. So a potential limitation is that it has, it's all online. So it has to be engagement through, a, through a, it could be through their mobile devices. So they need internet connection and mobile devices. And that was, so the infrastructure is based on that. So, but it could be training and engagement. I think the, the, there's an increasing use of mobile devices um, and there could be some training and some centers. So it's, th these are definitely uh, ways that we are, when we think about increasing the, the diversity, we will have to, to consider. Um, and I, as I mentioned, we just launched. So I think we, once we stabilize the infrastructure, um, we'll definitely um, think about, well, we're continually thinking about that, but. Um, we'll have to figure out ways to really um, engage the, the, these populations. As I said, one of the things that we cannot change is that it's mainly a, a, a recruitment through uh, online systems. Uh, the the follow-up is through online link linkage systems. Thanks, Monsi. And so I'll turn towards our international collaboration presenters. And I've heard questions or gotten questions about our remarks that sometimes reaching out to do these international collaborations is difficult and intimidating. Um, so my question is, what are some of the first steps you took, Laura and Jill, in initiating these international collaborations? And were there any sp special hoops that you had to jump through to initiate and sustain these to become successful? Um, Jill, can I go first? Um, I think it's uh, persistence and not giving up the first time you reach out. I, I learned, um, I, I can't even remember when I started, I always, you know, I'm from Latin America. I always, when, when I left, I knew I wanted to come back in terms of having collaborations there. And as soon as I, I think I graduated, I started reaching out. It takes a lot of patience to, um, find the right people, build the relationships, um, years of you know, talking and discussing and thinking how to get things done, trying different things. You know, Some of them don't get funded or not supported, but I think it's just keep going, keep working together with your collaborators. And I think it really helps if you have people in your team at least who are um, from Latin America, uh, can speak the language, can connect, um, you know, kind of understand some of the ways of doing things, which might be different. I mean, you do have to be a little bit flexible with certain things just because, you know, it's a different level of resources. You know, some things are not going to be possible and you have to be, you know, weigh pros and cons and, and keep going. I think that's my answer. Persistence. Jill. I just want to second everything that Laura said, it, it, persistence in particular. And let me also explain that this collaboration in Chile wasn't started by me. It was started by Caterina Ferreccio, who is the Chilean PI. And just to give you a sense of the kind of persistence that it takes, she started by approaching NCI back in the year 2000, more than 20 years ago. And it, it took her more than 10 years in, in engaging with NCI and talking with us and, and um, other investigators at NCI before we actually started even a pilot study. Uh, and also just to speak to trying different things, you know, you have to sort of st start with something and assess based on the questions that you really want to address, what is the best way that you can proceed in that place? So I, I completely agree. Um, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of persistence just to reach out and to try and, and to, to continue to push to really address the needs that we see in Hispanic populations. And I think you mentioned in your presentation 
the importance of your field team. And maybe you could expand on that a little bit. And Laura and Monsi, you as well, in conducting this type of research. Yeah, so, so in my case, I actually work, uh, you know, we have with Dr. Vidaure, um, the study in Peru, uh, but also I, you know, through the trying to put together the large consortium and through efforts in the past with the US Latin American network, I'm in constant, uh, constant conversation. I mean, I have weekly meetings with everyone. I, you know, we also do exchanges. I give lectures in their classes of it. You know, like you start kind of having this fluid uh, relationship back and forth um, and, and having these people in Latin America who, who, who are on your side in terms of trying to move the science forward. I think that's the, 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 the basis for being able to do it. So, you know, I couldn't do it at all if I didn't have uh, all the oncologists at the end um, and the pathologist, you know, meeting with me and willing to spend time. They, one of the issues is they have a different, they don't get, um, you know, the salary in a national cancer institute there for any investigator is paid by the, the National Cancer Institute. It's not like we can say, oh, well, you know, you get some money, so let's spend a lot of time doing this. It's um, you work different ways of doing things, and it's more through the enthusiasm and working on um, uh, the science with you that you engage. <laughs> so yeah, I think you need to find these these investigators who are passionate about science. They are not doing it for any other reason, really. Um, yeah, and just to follow up on that, uh, it's the people who are there in the field who who have the enthusiasm, who have the dedication, and are creative and, and think about how to make things work in any given situation. And certainly that's something that we saw in Chile Bills, where initially we started off completely recruiting people through a household census, where we were going house to house behind fences with outdoor bells, shouting to see if there was anyone in the house who might fit our criteria. Um, and then the team just really came up with creative ways to find other methods to recruit people that, that still allowed us to address our research question in a way that we were interested in. Um, with, the, with the global pandemic, we were shut down for months, not able to do work, but the team really stayed on top of things and they were prepared as soon as there was a, a possibility of getting out uh, and they used the resources they have. We had, fortunately, we had mobile clinics, so we were able to use those, not just stationary, uh, a stationary site. And it's only because of that and their dedication that, that we, we have been able to keep going at all in the middle of something you never planned for. I mean, your, your retention rate was astounding, what you showed us. So that's a tribute to you and your team. It's the team. It's, it's absolutely the team. I guess the next question I'll ask is about the NCI cohort consortium and I'll open this to Camille or Amy and ask, are there Hispanic cohorts in the cohort consortium that we can utilize as a resource to answer some of the important questions that we've discussed over the past two days? And what is the process for suggesting or proposing an idea within the NCI cohort consortium? Um, sure, I'll take it. So um, there are very few, I guess, um, Hispanic only cohorts in the core consortium. MEC is, of course, one of them, um, as well as um, Mano a Mano, um, the PI is Shine Chang um, in Texas, and I believe also the Mexican Teachers Cohort um, as well. So very few can. Um, in the span of the over 60 cohorts. But um, if there is an idea to um, propose a project to pull those cohorts together, um, anyone can certainly propose a, a, a pooling project um, through the, the core consortium project hub. Um, and yeah, there are um, systems in place to connect um, PIs uh, with someone who's interested in using uh, their data. So 
I would really encourage um, to attend the meeting um, to learn more about it. And um, I can also um, add the website to the chat as well. Is there a specific eligibility criteria for cohorts? Is that what limits the number of Hispanic cohorts in the cohort consortium? So um, for um, cohorts, uh, for etiologic cohorts, um, the minimum is 10,000 participants. Um, however, the consortium has just opened up to also including survivorship cohorts. And so that minimum is 2,000. Um, so we're hoping with um, reducing the, the amount of participants needed that will hopefully encourage more um, cohorts to join um, for survivor cohorts at least. And we had a follow-up question from Damali to about the cohort consortium. Are there Hispanics and other cohorts whereby we can harmonize the data from the Hispanics to look at some of the questions? I guess the answer is yes, right? If it's the right, <laughs> if it's the right set of variables and, and data. Yes, the CEDCD would have more information about what it, you know, what um, types of data each cohort collects. So I would start there to see if the variables are available to answer your questions. Um, but like I stated, like MEC, um, the Mono a Mono, and the, the Mexican teacher cohort are, are predominantly um, Hispanic cohorts. Um, there may also be uh, some numbers and some others, but the CEDCD would also have that information, enrollment counts and things like that. And I'll ask Amy about some of the FOAs that you presented. Have you seen, not a lot of them were specifically focused on Hispanic populations. Are you seeing grants come into those FOAs that at least have a component or, or are including Hispanic populations? Yeah, I think sort of, you know, following off of Camille's and the portfolio analysis, obviously there's a huge gap where we don't have enough research, um, but just highlighting the two um, new survivorship cohorts, you know, that were funded, um, two of them being Hispanic, one pediatric, one adult, um, you know, it's, there's increasing numbers. Um, and I think that, yes, it, and I, my first comment on the first slide was mentioning that, you know, it doesn't have to be explicitly Hispanic or even explicitly disparities or equity focused funding opportunity for it to be relevant. Um, you know, considering our division, the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, 76% of our portfolio um, in last year, so fiscal year 20 was, had a, of the funded projects had a health disparities component. So I think I saw it in the chat earlier where Joanne said, you know, a lot of this is initiator, uh, initiated by the investigators, um, you know, R1 research. So definitely, um, you know, most funding opportunities are relevant. Great. And we did see, I guess, in Camille's presentation that there were a, a large percentage of those Hispanic grants had been through not targeted funding opportunities. So the parent R01 and other opportunities. So Monsi, there's a question in the chat about Confluence and do you foresee future efforts like Confluence focusing on other types of cancer aside from breast? I think this should happen. We, it depends on funding availability. Um, and this is something that we have constant discussions with the NCI leadership in encouraging that and particularly um, increasing the, 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 the non-European populations because most of the GWAS studies are, um, uh, are have overrepresented, uh, not overrepresented, but have a majority of, of European um, ancestry populations. So I, I hope it will, there will be more and we are definitely loving as much as we can, but I'm not aware of any um, current efforts uh, with this, uh, at least from the intramural program. So I think I'm gonna ask my, final like big picture question here. We have about five minutes left. And a lot, you've answered a lot of these questions. And I think Laura, you just made an important point in the chat and maybe you want to bring that this up too. I just want to ask what kind of, what kind of resources do you think we need to answer some of the important questions that we want to ask 
um, in Hispanic populations? And how can NCI support some of these efforts other than funding? What kind of resources can um, NCI help build or support to move some of this work forward? Maybe I'll start with you, Laura. Yeah, I think funding is what we need. Um, there's people investing time to keep up databases. Uh, the, for example, I know the US Latin American Network has all these all this amazing molecular data as well as an epidemiological survey, but um, the grant, you know, the funding ended. And so the follow-up when, you know, didn't stay, you know, couldn't stay for longer. I mean, that's such a waste of an investment that was already done. Um, and, and you would have a lot richer um, information from five Latin American countries, which can be, you know, be informative in terms of different factors. Like, um, you know, um, they had socioeconomic status and other important information as well as molecular data and, and, and germline genetics. And so that's one example of there's, there's things like that where continuing these projects for longer, for example, would make a big difference, but they are cut short uh, or even sample size, it's like, oh, you're at this limit, you're done. And if they kept going a few more years, uh, this could be a great resort, resource in the future. So I'm just saying, um, sometimes the way these mechanisms work, they, they, they kind of leave you, you get support for a few years, you develop the resource, but then there's no continuation of support. And uh, it could be harder for these smaller infrastructure research groups to develop successful grants to keep things going. It's not like the MEC, right? Where you have millions of investigators sending ROAs. Here you have smaller groups um, uh, with, with more limited resources trying to keep up uh, and compete with the kind of um, grants that people um, in the US can develop. I'm just, that's my... Two cents. <laughs> great, that's great. And I know the rest of us on this panel are at NCI, so maybe I'll ask Jill and Monsi to sort of step out of their NCI role if they can and, and respond to that question. What kind of resources are needed to, to help further the research in Hispanic populations? If you can't answer that question, it's kind of a big picture question, but if you have any thoughts. Well, to I, when, when you say what kind of resources, I'm not sure if you mean sort of the, the type of resources or the amount of resources. So I think clearly um, new collections, new investing in new collections, new studies and infrastructure, investing on in the infrastructure that will make the, the sustainability easier, make more productive. I think that's really critical. So a problem we have confluence that Laura knows very well is that we are funding um, bringing together studies, existing studies and genotyping existing samples, but a limitation is there are not enough studies in, 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 Latin, in Latin America or Latin, that have enough Latinos in the US. So we're limited by that, so investing in new collections. And the, uh, the, the realization also that the, this new cohort that we're starting, that, is, uh, the, that the, the target populations of the centers uh, don't really, it's not going to end up with a large enough subset or, or uh, of, of studies uh, with uh, Latino, Latina populations. It's, it's, it's a really important to realize that and, and further invest on that and use the infrastructure that we're developing to really make it a bit more cost effective to really add study new populations, collect good information. There's been a lot of discussions in this meeting about how to collect information about um, the, the, the demographics and the heterogeneity of these populations. So I think this uh, more field work, I think is one of the key, key uh, lags, uh, gaps that we really need to address. And I love that Clarissa mentions all of us in the chat. I think that is gonna be a good resource yes. across different populations. And what we heard in this previous, in the previous session about leveraging other um, epidemiology, non-cancer epidemiology studies for cancer epidemiology studies, I think we have to keep going back to that. And Camille, in your new role, we'll come back to you to help us with that at NIA. But I think we're out of time for this session. I wanna thank everybody. I think this has been a great session. 